Okay. I've been really... Um, uh, there's, there's two aspects of this book going on. One of them is really very specifically that Swamiji is taking certain well-known Hindu symbols. We're working now with Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And he's really trying to explain in ways that have not really ever been explained before what these symbols actually mean. And when you, of course, we're, we're teaching this in a Western context. And if you've traveled in India some or have Indian friends, um, you may appreciate, but I think we can only barely appreciate, sort of how, how powerfully these symbols hold um, uh, the, the force that they have in the context of the Indian culture and how um, radical what Swamiji is saying really is. And, and the effort he's trying to make to sort of extricate from, essentially from Hinduism, he's trying to extricate self-realization. And I, I appreciate, especially when we sort of got into this part of this book, um, Swami Kriyananda has this very unusual mission and that, that he, he really has been, he was given this job by Yogananda. Yogananda was given this job by, by God and by Babaji and by Christ really to carry to the West and from the West to the whole world a whole new perspective on, on religion and spirituality to, to usher in a new age. You know, we sort of just live our lives. We're just hanging out here. We have this one incarnation. We have our little homes and our little jobs and our little karmic things that we're working with. And we are also associated with this great teaching, but it's, um, it's not an everyday thought for us that we, we carry this responsibility. Whereas for Swami Kriyananda, who came as a young disciple to Yogananda at the age of 22, and almost immediately Master started speaking to him about this great work that he was going to have to do. I mean, he was 22, definitely a highly advanced soul, definitely with an extraordinarily mature and deep consciousness, but nonetheless, just a very young man. And Master was in the last years of his life, and Master is putting into Swami both this, um, uh, what do you say, this responsibility, this commandment, commission is the word I used, but, um, and also pouring the energy into Swamiji f to do something that Swami himself is not entirely sure what it is. You know, and, and by the time Swami is 25, Master's left the planet. And within a very short time after that, his successor Rajasi is also gone. So Swamiji never really gets anybody to spell this out for him. And of course, then he goes through the whole cycle of another 10 years of being part of SRF, and he's looking to these senior women disciples for some kind of guidance, and the only feedback he gets from them is totally contradictory to what his understanding of Master's instructions to him are. And he's obedient to his monastic superiors, but they're not his guru. And then Swamiji, in 1958, gets sent by us SRF over to India. And when he gets to India, which is even though Swamiji had traveled extensively from babyhood, he says he was six months old the first time he crossed the Atlantic because his family was stationed in Romania and they, they got leave to go home. So picked up the little baby and took him back to meet the grandparents in Oklahoma. And as he says, essentially he's never stopped since then. And Romania, he describes very interestingly, as sort of a, uh, the point at which East meets West. Romania is somewhat where he was born and spent his first 13 years, somewhat westernized, but it's also very oriental. So it was sort of like he grew up in this mixed culture. But when he went to India in 1958, Master had told him when Master was alive that he was going, the last year of Master's life, Master had said, I'm going to go back to India and I'll take you with me. I mean, so it was no small disappointment among many other disappointments when Master didn't live to carry out that promise. So six years later, Swamiji got to go to India. And what happened to him when he got to India, essentially as he describes it, was that he, he had confirmed on a very deep level his own understanding of what Master's teachings were. Because 
the way the senior women disciples had been putting it forward, who were extremely Western in their way of thinking. In fact, um, most of them had been raised as Mormons, which is about as sort of westernized an approach to religion as you can get, just completely dogmatized and hierarchical and church-oriented. And so their whole background was, you know, didn't have a fraction of the cosmopolitan international vibration that Swami had. I mean, already by the time he was 22, he was speaking four languages. I mean, well, he was, he was raised in three and had learned, um, let's see, he, he must have been speaking five languages by that time because he was raised in, in three, English, German, and Romanian, and then he learned French as a child, and then he learned Spanish as, in his late teens. So he was already up to five languages, plus just having this very unusual background. But they, who were defining SRF after Master died and after Rajasi died, were just making a church out of it and have continued to make a church out of it ever since. So Swami is... is well, I think the actual word is escapes from that atmosphere and is in India, and he's pretty much all on his own. There is an SRF, um, YSS organization there that he's associating with, but they're all Indian people, and he doesn't really fit in that much with them, and there's not that much going on anyway, so he has a tremendous amount of freedom. And what he discovers is he discovers the, the whole Eastern, the whole Indian way of approaching spirituality, which Swami deals with, he talks about in here in the very chapter that we're talking about. He talks about the how the revelation of Sanatana Dharma is crystal clear and never changing, but he, he describes just a marvelous inconsistency and uh, uh, in the way it's expressed, and and he 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 really emphasizes, and he's talking about it again in this chapter how. The Western attitude toward keeping the teaching pure is the thought that we will control this and by our controlling of it, we will prevent any aberration from setting in. And what happens, of course, is that, as he's described to us earlier in this book, revelation can't be controlled. By the time it's expressed, it's already diminished. It's not nothing that anybody can do on that level actually presents the teaching. So it's such a, it's sort of a, it gets to be kind of oxymoronic situation here where by the time you have the concept that you're going to control the purity of the teaching, you've already betrayed the revelation to such an extent that there's nothing you can do except just gussy up the corpse, more or less, which is an extreme peculiarity because our Western orientation is so religion-oriented. So when Swami got to India, he suddenly saw that their entire system it's really the whole culture of India when you're in it. It's becoming more, the East and West are coming together. But there's this basic thought form, which is, you're responsible for your own destiny. Someone told me that when he bought a car over there, one of our American friends who lives there, if you have a car and you have car insurance, your insurance is only for your car. Nobody insures anybody else's car, and you don't insure what you might do to someone else. It's like you're responsible for your car, and you can insure it if you want to or, or not insure it. And that's just sort of your problem. It's a whole different orientation. In the West, in America most particularly, whenever any little thing happens, there's this tremendous effort to make a whole lot of laws to make sure it'll never happen again. A tree falls on someone in a downtown area, so the city cuts down all the trees to make sure another branch will never fall on anybody ever again. Or a child falls off a merry-go-round, and then all these rules are made about how merry-go-rounds have to be installed. And, I mean, it just goes on and on, because there's this tremendous sense that everybody has to be protected, and that, that somebody is responsible for protecting us. In fact, uh, one of the, among the many predictions that Master made about the difficult times that would come to this country, which we may be on the first chapter of seeing if the economic situation continues as it is, is that one of the reasons that this economic difficulty will be worse than what the country went through in the 30s is because over all these intervening years, the, whereas Americans were highly self-reliant in the, in the early part of the 1900s, by now the early part of the 2000s, we have become quite convinced that somebody is, should be taking care of us. You know, even I was just thinking recently about that Hurricane Katrina and how so many people, 
And it's true, maybe, that people didn't respond in the way they should have responded. But the underlying point of view is that somebody owes us. Somebody should be taking care of us. And even when they were taken care of in shelters and things like that, there's still all these uh, comments about how it wasn't carried out properly. We didn't get this, we didn't get that. You know, that whole orientation, which uh, if, if uh, deprivation really sets in and people feel like they're owed, you can see that the response to that is anger. And the response to that is, can often be an aggressive anger. Because if I'm owed, then I have a right to take or do whatever I want. I mean, just to continue with this extremely unpleasant possibility, somebody was saying to me just a couple of days ago, that 50% of American households have guns. Isn't that an interesting statistic? And they actually that person said to me that one in four people has a legally registered weapon. One in four? It's not the world we live in, that's for sure, because our statistics are not like that. I don't even know if those are accurate or not, but that's even legal, not even talking illegal. But you can see if anger builds and there are that many weapons in the country, it could be a, a very exciting and interesting period of time Um, everything could be very different. Peculiarly, and maybe perhaps with a sense of premonition, who knows, I've always, I've read a lot of books about um, true stories about wars and catastrophes and imprisonments and refugees and um, famines and orphans and, you know, and it's, it's just sort of interesting, even in the worst of conditions, people figure out a way to live. You just sort of gradually get organized and you keep going. You just are yourself in all circumstances and So we will be. Well, coming back to Swamiji going to India, Swamiji writes in this, the first of the three chapters we're reading tonight, he talks about how the entire philosophy of India is actually what the famous Rabbi Gamliel says in the Acts of the Apostles when the priests were trying to suppress this new sect of Christianity and and they were beginning to persecute and try to eliminate the people who were following Jesus because it was such a threat to their way of doing things. As Swamiji writes in here, established religion is never fond of direct intuitive perception. Because how do you control direct intuitive perception? How do you ensure that the intuition will always be consistent? How do you make sure that the right people get the intuitions? SRF, who's tried very hard this way, some of their most confused exponents, I'm not going to give, it to, give credit to everyone, but the blame, Well, essentially, it's how could you have a genuine vision unless you're a monk or a nun who has a high position in the organization. And in the Catholic Church, it's just such a problem because some, you know, little priest over here who has no credentials whatsoever will start, you know, manifesting the stigmata or something that he shouldn't be doing, and it just throws the whole system off. So they generally try not to allow those things to have much force until after the person is safely dead. But... And the rabbi in the Acts of the Apostles said, we really don't, we really ought not to, and in fact, we don't need to oppose this. He says, if, it's, if this teaching, meaning the teaching of Jesus at that time, is of God, we don't want to risk standing against God's will. And he said, and if it's not of God, it will simply die out of its own. It won't have the power to sustain itself. And in either case, why do we have to become engaged in this? So in India, they've always had the thought that things will sort themselves out gradually and that people can assert whatever they want. We don't have to have a big system for keeping it all in order. Let people come up and declare themselves to be prophets. If they're true prophets, then it will, over time it will prove to be so. And if they're false prophets, they'll just go away. It's also based on a much longer rhythm. You know, India is a very ancient culture, so if it takes a few generations for some aberration to sort of rise and fall. And also, it's like individuals are responsible for their own karma. Nobody has to protect you from getting engaged with a false teaching. If you want to get engaged with a false teaching, well, that's your karma. And it doesn't mean that you can't be concerned or something, but you don't have to make rules and laws about it. So Swamiji moved out of what was a very westernized, increasingly institutionalized approach to master's teachings and went to India and suddenly found all his own inner perceptions of this teaching totally verified. And it, it put him on the road. Of course, 
What finally happened to him is four years later, SRF expelled him um, for what they considered to be just a complete lack of attunement with Master's actual will. But in fact, he was getting in tune with Master's will, but it was very different than what they had in mind. It's the, as Swamiji said, it was, of course, the best thing that ever happened to him. But uh, Dayamata actually said to him at one point that India ruined him. And it was actually very perceptive because it, it ruined him in the sense that it gave him confidence, greater confidence in his own perception of things. So that is what happened. But then after that, you see, then when Swamiji was on his own, which is, this is a story that you all have heard a lot of times, but it's important to contemplate it because it helps us understand what's going on in this book. Then Swamiji just sees himself, okay, I have to carry out, I, I have a great work to do for Master. So what was Master's work? And Master's work is to be the avatar of Dwapara Yuga, to bring forward the same truth that's been taught since the beginning of time in the context of these chapters, Swamiji states when he gets into the, the last chapter and the secret garden and the gateway into the spine and how self-realization takes place from raising the energy up and going through the gates of the chakras and interiorizing the energy and going into the shushumna, all the things that we're talking about in these chapters. He said, this is the way it's always going to be. No matter what planet you're on, no matter what age you're on, because this is the way... And he talks about this in our second chapter, the Brahma secret, the four heads of Brahma, and talking about how um, creation happens from the inside out, that there's this seed point of, of divinity, and everything expresses from the inside out. It's center everywhere. Extraordinary phrase. It's center everywhere and circumference nowhere. And therefore, everything, I mean, infinitely, every aspect, wherever we can go. When I first came onto the spiritual path, I, I, I remember being 18, but maybe I was 19. It was right in those very early years when somebody put the books of Vivekananda into my hands and um, the concept was there that consciousness was the key. That was how it, it came to me. That was the first thing that came to me. <gasps> change consciousness, change everything. And I, I didn't have... It's very interesting when one looks back on one's early years on the spiritual path because I, I, I can feel the duality I was living. And the duality I was living was what I would call extreme clarity of heart, which is I, I knew that I'd found my place. Even before I found Swamiji, I knew that in Sanatana Dharma, which was, as I say, was introduced to me first through Ramakrishna and Vivekananda's teachings, I just knew in the, literally in the, the minute I was given the first book that I'd found my place. So there was this absolute certainty. It, it's odd, isn't it? I was, I was contemplating recently that I have some elderly friends who don't have um, any belief in a world beyond this one. Very intelligent, but they don't have any faith in anything. And, and now they're you know, very close to death, not actually on their deathbeds, but they're at the end of their lives. And, you know, it seems like a good idea to think about death, don't you think? Except if you don't really believe that there's anything except annihilation, then why would you think about it? It's it very complicated. So I've been trying to think of ways to help them. And, and part of it is that I'm certain about these things. I'm just absolutely certain but I don't know how I could explain to them why I'm so certain. You know, it's not like I have visions and I see how the cosmos works together or anything like that. I've had one dream about a past life, but I just know that this is true. I've always known it was true. It's because, of course, we've had many lifetimes practicing this. But the point of this is, there's this inner intuitive certainty that no one can take away from you once you have it. It's just the way things are. And it isn't rational. I can't make it rational. I can't tell you why I know, because I knew before I had the words for it. Before I had philosophy, I had the certainty. It's from the inside out. It's not from the outside in. And uh, let's see. Oh, but, but the, what I was starting to say is that memory of that er those early years is that, that the brain is just a mess. 
And I know that my behavior was very erratic and energetic and positive and enthusiastic, but very erratic for at least a decade at Ananda. I mean, I really for longer than that, but really dramatically erratic for at least a decade. Um, and my thoughts were quite confused. But at the same time, when I reflect inwardly back on that, I, I have this powerful force of clarity. It was like the two levels existed simultaneously. My soul knew exactly what it was doing and it never wavered. And my mind just ran in circles, not circles of doubt, just circles of chaos and confusion. But one of my very early memories of those, that time was, was the way I recall it. I lay awake all night looking at the ceiling. I doubt if I did because I seldom didn't sleep. But that was how it felt to me. And I projected myself in every possible direction I could think of, trying to find an alternative to the spiritual path. You know, ha- trying to find an alternative to the necessity to take absolute responsibility for my consciousness. I was thinking, you know, no matter what happens, I was very young, but no matter what happens, I knew that the point would come when I would die. I mean, this has to be past lives. The point would come when I would die, and when I would die, no matter what I had done in the intervening years, it would all recede and all that I would have left was my consciousness. And there was absolutely no way to escape from that fact. And therefore, everything about the spiritual path followed from it. And I think that was in many ways the sort of... um, There was a, I think that was the point at which I would have to say to myself that I absolutely decided to be on the spiritual path because there was no escaping it. So what I was saying here is what Swami writes is that the process of of creation being manifested, of souls becoming, um, as he describes it, gradually more aware and then gradually more self-aware And then that self-awareness leads to a deeper identity. He describes that so beautifully, just about how the ego grows and how it's not really a bad thing. It's just you start out as a rock and and you're part of consciousness. Master at least is credited with saying that he remembers his individuality back to the level of a diamond, which is just a... You don't even know how to begin to think about that. You know, I, I wear gemstones and... He, he, they say, you know, that the level of the crystal is the point at which is a sort of transition point. Between, someone described it once as matter and ener- between matter and energy. That there's a, some kind of a consciousness that you feel in these. I'm sure, did any of you all see the uh, National Geographic article about the cave they discovered somewhere in Mexico where they found crystals, perfect crystals as big as buildings. I mean, huge buildings. And it, it had been buried under water, and then they drained it because they were mining something out of there. And they discovered these huge caverns with these huge crystals. And I, I watched a film about it. It was just it was so intriguing to me. The conditions are terrible in there, like you know, 120 degrees, and so it's very hard for people to go in there. But you see these giant forms, and and it's the beginning of individualized consciousness. And Swamiji describes in here how. You sort of become more and more aware. You know, you go from, I mean, over what period of time? If you go from being a diamond to being a self-realized master, I mean, like what kind of span? It's just, you can't even think about it. But one becomes more and more actively aware. And, and you be, go through the, the rocks, the crystals, you become a more and more refined, refined rock. You go into the plant world, you gradually become a rose. You know, from a rose, you get to be a, a, a bacteria, a snail. I mean, what do you get next? And then as you gradually expand your awareness, you become more and more self-aware. And, and you see yourself in relation to everything until gradually you begin to identify with the separateness. And the way Swami writes, it's not a... The ego is not a negative thing. It's a necessary stage. We have to become... Um, just like we say in the Festival of Light, for what end were we made? Ever and again through your awakened sons, the answer comes. 
passage through dim corridors of waking consciousness to emerge at last into perfect bliss, into perfect light. We sort of, everything is gradually waking up. That's what creation is about. And we, as we wake up, we, we move from our periphery back into our interior. We, we roll back up that process of external creation. If you've ever been with someone who dies, uh, we've, been, we've, ever been, well, we've all been with someone who dies. If you've ever been with someone when they die, when a person dies, people die from the periphery. And they, the, the consciousness rolls back up to the spine. And, and they go, people lose consciousness of their limbs if they die consciously and slowly. You can, you'll feel their hands will go cold, their feet will go cold. On several occasions when I was with someone who was dying and they were not conscious, you can put your hands on their feet. When their limbs begin to get colder and colder, you know that the consciousness is receding. And one woman that I was sitting with when she died, you just watched it. You watched... Everything, like you just could watch the life force recede until the life force was just in the spine and then the life force crawls up the spine. Now, that's the physical. I mean, and the nurse tells me, well, gradually the diaphragm becomes paralyzed and then the person can't breathe anymore. But that's sort of what's happening. The consciousness is just coming back up and then it'll be just a little bit here and then it's gone. It's very moving. It's deeply moving to watch someone die, to just sort of be there and and sense, you know, that uh, reverse. Now, of course, that's physical death, which is imposed upon us. Not one of us will be able to escape it. it the, the day will come and we'll experience it. But the spiritual death, so to speak, which is actually rebirth, is when we, we willfully, by the det- we, in the same way that the ego gradually became more and more identified with this individuality, and as it became more identified, the way Swami describes the process of, of reincarnation, which is a fascinating way to say it, we just keep having to inhabit a more and more sophisticated body in order to express the increasingly sophisticated nature of our consciousness. And he's, he speaks of the fact that it's very good karma for animals to be pets because in association with human beings it helps accelerate their evolution because otherwise they just hang out with other tigers and lions or dogs and you know that they all just kind of live on the same level and it and new realities don't necessarily come into them but a dog who gets to spend his whole life with human beings is always getting all kinds of experiences that he wouldn't have otherwise and he's also in a vibratory way in a different relationship and the human being is also pulling his consciousness upward and so people's thoughts that my cat well I don't know if my cat would be reborn as my child but the the idea I know some people will say that's true and I I'm going to refrain from commenting but the idea that um, a, a, a very conscious animal would then be able to transition into a human is exactly true because its capacities have increased and at a certain point, no animal body is sophisticated enough to be able to express that capacity. Once you reach the human level, as is described here, the human level has the spine and the chakras and the irda and the pingala and the shushumna, and all of that is possible. You don't need a more sophisticated body than a human. These are the ways in which a master has clarified the different people's ideas. It's not as if the human body has to be refined. The way our consciousness is in relationship to that body has to be refined. But the human body, Adam and Eve, created by God, which is what that represents, has the capacity to be God-realized. That's why a master can walk around in a human body, Jesus can walk around in a human body and still be self-realized within it. Because the nervous system is sophisticated enough to do that if we understand how that really works. So... Um, coming back to where I was with the story about Swamiji and going to India and so on. So he finds himself in 1962 at the age of 36 completely cut off from the whole manner in which he thought he was going to carry out his discipleship. And he has to um, refigure it, reconfigure it completely from within himself um, in relationship to Master 
without any now any input from any other guru bhai and most peculiarly and i'm sure in retrospect you see it had to be this way swami ji had almost no contact almost literally no contact and definitely no close association with any other direct disciple he was completely left through through his whole life he's been left in fact he said enormous antagonism from his guru bhais but above all he had no he had no partner he had all of us but all of us were much younger and all of us our discipleship came through him so it wasn't anybody else who could stand next to him and say and discuss with him as a peer the closest he had to that of course was ananda moima who was her, her who gave him a great deal of energy and inspiration but she was as he said more like um he had with her the relationship he was too young to have with master that's how he said it so then swami ji has had to just go step by step and try to think well what would master want to have expressed here what would master have said about this how how can i go through all the different possibilities really on the planet and turn as many of them as possible in the direction of self realization as as master wanted it taught now master was born in india and this teaching that he brought over to us was certainly you know indian in its implications master had uh, brought that consciousness if he didn't bring the culture which he deliberately didn't bring if he didn't bring hinduism which he deliberately didn't bring nonetheless he brought that i think bhav is the only word he brought that oriental mindset and there and there was always that feeling that master had brought these teachings from india and there was always this parallel reality of what was going on in india and his whole autobiography the whole autobiography is about this extraordinary upbringing in india and the first sentence of the autobiography is the what does he say the characteristic of the indian culture has always been the search for eternal verities the first sentence of the autobiography is about the indian culture but then when you go to india what you find is hinduism which is intensely confusing and as swami ji writes here when he's talking about the tradition that the four heads of brahma which look in the four directions relate to the four vedas which swami ji points out are you know is a way of saying that brahma himself endorses the tradition of the indian people and and swami goes on to say it even more explicitly the priests who read sanskrit and know how to operate from the vedas and then all the rest of us are just left having to be um faithful to what they tell us even if they're not corrupt we still have to be faithful to that tradition because brahma himself endorses it and you can see how the the freedom of self realization it can't it's it's inconsistent what what master brought for dwapar yuga is this intensely individualized um personal responsibility for our own spiritual life this is what swami's talking about when he talks about the secret garden and you have the key and you go in and then it's up to you you know you have to make your way through that garden no one can no one can do it for you that was my you know 19 year old insight into the spiritual path that sooner or later i would die i would be entirely alone with my own consciousness and even though i was a young person i really felt i better get busy because when that moment comes there's not going to be any nothing else is going to exist but that and i'm going to sure wish that i had pulled myself together by that point nothing's going to seem nearly as important as having the right consciousness i mean that was these are what, what you, you can only call these past life intuitions how can you feel those things even now i i find it interesting ever since i turned 60 which is now 2 years ago i think a lot about um what kind of a child i'll be when i when i have to face my next incarnation i'm i'm assuming i'll have one you know even if i succeed which is in god's hands you know in becoming a jeevan mukta which swami ji has challenged us all to become but i don't even want to discuss it on as a serious you know one way or another it's just not worth discussing but assuming that i have another body either as a jeevan mukta or not what kind of a child 
what kind of a child would result from being the kind of person I am now? And then I look back on my childhood and I see a lot of things I did that were really not what I would want to do again. And I wasn't a bad kid, but, you know, I would like to be a lot more aware a lot sooner. And I would just like to manifest a lot more fine qualities a lot younger and not have to spend so much time digging through the mud and being an idiot, you know? So I've been I, almost like sending, trying to send a telepathic message. It, it's, it's a confusing question to me. I've asked Swamiji sort of to tell me, how much do you hold? Like, how much do you hold of acquired wisdom in one lifetime that's based on age and experience when you're just a child and you don't have that age and experience again? Obviously, the more advanced you are, the more you can hold. But I'm also trying to, like, will it to my future incarnation. Do you know what I mean? But just try to um, enter that secret garden and not leave it. By, by deeply impressing upon yourself. One of my friends said when she was 10 years old, she didn't know anything about the spiritual path. She did not have a particularly happy childhood. and She would say to herself, childhood is not all that it's cracked up to be, don't forget. She would say that to herself, not even knowing what she was speaking of, but don't forget. In other words, don't get sucked into it again. So, once again, Swamiji, um, to pick up all the different threads we're weaving together here, you know, he, he, had, he has had to look at this Eastern reality and try to just shave it away. So he, he takes a, a symbol like Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. And I mean, I recall very vividly when one of my extremely westernized friends indicated to me how little we know about the Indian culture, how, how little we understand it. That was also two decades ago. But when he said to me, oh, Brahma married his own daughter, that's why there's no temples to Brahman anywhere. You know, like, it was, it's such a scandal among the gods, you know, <laughs> that no, no really righteous person would ever, you know, want to worship such a person. <sniffs> bad man, bad man like that. And yet, of course, you know, what could we be talking about? So Swamiji, you know, brings up, and he's, he's described in here so vividly about the, the, what all of the symbolism really represents and, and talks about how all the different confusion has set in because we're really talking about three aspects of Om, but then Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, each one of them, even though it's three aspects of Om, and Om is only one aspect of the infinite spirit, that each one of those individual deities gets pulled out to be the Supreme Lord himself, and then everybody has to build a whole system completely around him. But you see also how... Uh, what a challenge um, that Rishi's had trying to put into, into something graspable by the human mind that which they could perceive directly, but then we had to understand. So they drew all these images, they drew all these pictures, and then, as Swamiji says, they weren't, they weren't consistent. Because one person would have an image and see it in a certain way, one would have an image and see it in another way. I mean, how often... Even among our own friends, do you have someone come up and tell you some great revelation they've had? And maybe it makes a lot of sense to you, and maybe it doesn't. You know? And it's just like everybody sees things in their own way. Okay. So now let me go on with this. Are there any questions or thoughts about where I, what I think I said? What I was really appreciating today... Oh, here, this is what I was... What I really... The final point of what I was saying with all of that is how extremely important this book is for people who are committed to Hinduism. Because it allows them, just in the same way that Master's teaching of self-realization has given Christ back to a lot of people. Because people who got caught up and turned off by um, institutional ways of describing Jesus, or got born into Jewish families and had Jesus completely be beyond the pale, Master came through with his re-expression of those teachings and basically has given back to us the essence of the whole, that whole tradition. And so many thinking people, and Swamiji writes here, here about it, you know, people who get caught up in 
impressed by, and appropriately so, the whole expansive scientific point of view on life. And then in their own culture, they see this Brahma with four heads riding on a swan who married his own daughter. And, and naturally, there's just this, I wouldn't want to have anything to do with that. But because there has been nothing to replace it, what you see is a gradual deterioration of people's ability to be um, in tune with the spirit because there's just so much confusion. So Swamiji is trying to just cut that away and give us a way to say, look, this is a very, actually a fascinating and an amazing image in the midst of all of this, um, which is what he's talking about here. So, so he talks about how, and there's, there's also the other thing in here, which is uh, very interesting. Uh, in our, one of our earlier classes when we were talking about the essential revelations, what are the essential revelations of Sanat and Dharma? And one of them is that creation is, is dual, that there's, there's this duality always through creation and there's the masculine and feminine which is always going to be acting out. And it's, it's so, um, it's such an interesting fact how intensely that masculine and feminine permeates everything. And really, when you think about it, it's one of the most profound experiences that we have of life. So many people's lives are, you know, largely ruled by that energy in our, either through our family life, our desire to have a family, um, the, the way the masculine or feminine influences us according to the body that we're in, all of these different things. And all the way through all of this Hindu mythology, there's always this masculine and feminine force playing together. And even when the whole story we have here about Brahma and um, Saraswati, who's his consort, and how when Brahma is playing um, the masculine role, then Saraswati plays the feminine role. But then when Brahma plays the, the creative, active, intercreation role, then Sar Saraswati becomes another part. That they're always, the masculine and feminine are always in this dance, balancing each other out. And this is also just even in itself showing us sort of how in our own personal lives, in our own inner life, what to speak if we have external relationships we're working with, that there's always going to be this ever sort of shifting back and forth where the, and in this case where the outwardly creative energy has to be guided from this inward force. That there always has to be the the inward force, and there's always this divine mother aspect of Om, as Swami calls it. You know that both manifests out and actively puts forward this creation, and then yet in the very center of us is always calling us back inside again. It's a fascinating um, realization that we can never get away from that, and all of this very complex mythology is always showing us this again. And the other aspect about Saraswati in this particular case that I, I never really exactly tuned in, Saraswati has always been the goddess of speech, of music, and of wisdom. And I would always hear speech, music, and wisdom. Well, she's the aspect of Om. And of course, the voice in speech and music is going to be the sound of Om as it, as it comes out from the Om and manifests through human consciousness is going to come out either as music or as voice. But there was, then there was that aspect of wisdom. And then what he describes here is that when Saraswati becomes the Shashumna, the, the union of the upward and downward flowing energies of the spine and the channel through which the Kundalini rises and we attain realization, well, that's, the, that's when the wisdom aspect comes in, you see. Because as we attain that higher and higher state of realization, <clears throat> Saraswati blesses us with true understanding. And in between, when we're trying to express the creativity that Brahma represents, when we're trying to be, as we talked about last week, the creative person, and the necessity for that creativity, which is... Uh, a part of our evolution spiritually is that we begin to be able and, and then Swamiji talks about how true creativity can only come 
when we have interiorized our perception and raised it. So even before Saraswati graces us with the wisdom of self-realization, the more we get in tune with that inward reality, the more profoundly and deeply we can create. And then this is where Swami begins to talk about the four heads of Brahma. I, I don't have pictures of these deities. I realize later it would be beneficial because you may not have them as clearly in your mind as you might. But, but Brahma is often presented in these four factors. And in the Hindu tradition, it's just understood. He's, he's emphasizing the four directions and he's affirming the four Vedas. That's just, that's what people say about it. But Swamiji spends a long time in this chapter talking about how really unlikely that is. First of all, he said, how can the creator of, of, of everything be committed to something that didn't exist before he created it? How can he be subservient to that? And he also raises the obvious question, which is the Vedas represent an ancient tradition and a priesthood. This is what I was saying earlier. And he said, creativity itself, by its very nature, is not inclined to be orthodox. You know, it, or he said, or at least the creator would have to test the limits of that particular theory, which I really enjoyed his way of saying that. Which is, it's innovative. That's what creativity is. You innovate. You see what's already there and you innovate it. You know, in, in an institutional religious setting, too much creativity is not a benefit. That was, in fact, one of the problems Swami had in SRF, is that he was too creative for the institutional approach they wanted to take, where you're always taking it apart and finding something new. So, um, Swami really talks about how, you know, everything in creation is from the inside out, and how Master talked about the consciousness of every atom, and that every atom is a complete universe within itself. I remember this from high school science, which I never comprehended then, but they made all those little charts and they showed you how this, within each atom you'd have a little miniature version of everything that you're seeing. And, and he talks about how everything that's created, you know, starts from this first inner reality. And then he gives us advice about if we really want to relate properly both to ourselves and this world, he said that, that we, we look at the world through our senses and that gives us the impression that the external comes first and then we take in that information and try to make sense out of it this way. But he quotes Master's statement, which he said is one of Master's most important statements of all, that spirit is center everywhere and circumference nowhere. I mean, how many times have we all heard that? We've heard that many, many times. But when you really stop, as Swami forces us to do when we study this chapter, and really hear what the implications of that are. Um, first of all, it puts every atom in creation on equal terms. You know? There's, there's no point, there's no person, there's no point that isn't completely on equal terms because the center, the same center of spirit is in the center of everything. All right? Um, we were talking about uh, uh, center everywhere, circumference nowhere, and during the break there was a little bit of a discussion just about um, gradually beginning to have perceptions, just simple perceptions. Sarah was saying about just seeing the fact that everything is an energy flow. I, I had that kind of small epiphany, I think, when I center everywhere, circumference nowhere. And Swami's sort of talking to us about how, how we can really can and should really relate to life if we're going to do it from truth and not just from um, the outward manifestation of, of Om, where Om has sucked us out into the alternating currents of male and female and light and dark and, and all of our sense perceptions. And we desperately, I love the way he says it, we look at the world through our senses and then we try to make sense by, by, by putting all the episodes together. You know, well, this happened to me and that happened to me. It's not, didn't that just describe it? We try to make sense by putting all the episodes together. Well, this worked, that didn't work. I'm going to do this. I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to have a five-year plan. You need to know where you're going. I mean, just, we just try to, I didn't have a plan, so that's how I ended up here. I didn't have a retirement account, so next time I'm going to have a retirement account. We put all the episodes together. 
But then we, we understand this thought that it all emanates from the center. And we can't put all the episodes together and ever make it make a consistent whole. Whole. The only way, what makes a whole but not a whole, is that the only way we can make any sense of it is if we get deeper and deeper into that point of origin. Swamiji um, made the statement, interestingly, in terms of creativity, that we really need to strive to be original. And the meaning of originality is not to do that which has never been done before, but to act from our own point of origin. And if we really want to be original, we need to be in touch with our own point of origin. And um, again, what Swami was saying is that the entire universe can be understood from any central point because spirit is center everywhere. And that, that's, and he was even saying, if you want to understand other people, we try so, we, we, we're so inclined to understand things from the outside in. We study them, we get analytical concepts about them, but the way he put it, the way Master put it, is you have to have compassion and then you'll understand. You have to enter into the center of whatever reality it is you're trying to understand, whether you're trying to be a, a painter or a singer or a good friend or a parent, you have to enter into the center. I was thinking today about parenting. Um, somebody asked me to write a little something about parenting and I've, I've never raised children. I don't know really very much about parenting at all except sort of past life memories. I'm definitely not willing to put myself out as an authority. But I, I realize in retrospect that I've actually helped a lot of my friends over the years with the raising of their children, partly because I'm not a parent and I do see it from the outside. But one of the simple things that I have often recommended is you have to see it from your child's point of view. In other words, you have to stand inside from their center and try to feel what it is that they're actually trying to do. And in parenting especially, there's such an inclination to try to see it from your point of view and then to impose your point of view on them. And, and it's a delicate balance because as a parent, one has a responsibility to mold what is basically this primitive savage that's been given to you and you have to sort of bring them up. You know, they can't, they can't do anything like civilized people and you have to raise them up into civilization. But nonetheless, they move from their own point of origin. And especially as they get a little older and especially as they become teenagers, they're moving so strongly from their own point of origin that if you try to relate to them without standing in that, own, that point of origin and looking out through their eyes, you'll never get anywhere with them. My nephew actually was very astute. He was very helpful to me. I started, I said something to him and I heard, I, I, I heard my father speaking to me at, at exactly the same age that I that my nephew was at that moment, and my father was speaking, had spoken to me in exactly the tone of voice with the attitude that I was speaking to him. He looked at me with exactly the look I know I gave my father at that same moment. I mean, it was, I vividly remember that being that age. And I don't know what the issue was. And, and I, one specific, it was related to, I remember my father was extremely certain that a course of action I was on would prove to be entirely impractical and, and unsupportable. And of course he was right. And he thought he would help me by showing me all the practical details of why eventually it would fall to pieces, which I was totally uninterested in, even though it was factual. And, and my nephew articulated to me what I hadn't been able to articulate to my father. He said, but you don't understand how much energy and creativity I have. In other words, of course it's going to fall apart, but you're old and you think that's a problem. <laughs> I just think it's an adventure. Right? Isn't that just, doesn't that just about sum it up? Because to me, I don't have, I mean, I think I'm more than some of my age, but I know my father did not have the energy or the creativity to deal what, with what, inevitably happened to me. But when it inevitably happened, it wasn't a problem for me. I just kind of moved through it and went on to the next story because I was full of energy and creativity and optimism and all the other things that youth has. You see, because standing inside of, of my center, it looked entirely different than it looked standing inside of his. And, and so, in everything that we do in our lives, the great difficulties that we 
have or that we don't stand inside that center. And sometimes we make the mistakes in the negative also. I mean, when the 9-11 experience happened and people said, oh, we just have to love the terrorists, we can't speak against them. Well, you also have to stand inside their center and see the world as they're seeing it. If you really want to relate, you can't just naively sort of stand in your reality and just assume that you can push on their periphery and it'll change. You have to stand in the center of their consciousness and see why they're doing what they're doing and where they're going with it and understand the internal logic of that before you can figure out what to do next. And often it's very, very different when you stand inside of it like that. I don't mean, even if you stand in, way inside where it's just divinity, still there's that karmic trajectory that's going to have to carry itself through. And even understanding ourselves, the more deeply we can get into that center of everything. And the other part that I was touching was how extraordinarily egalitarian that is, isn't it? And it, it makes one so non-judgmental because everybody is, has this origin point of spirit and they're just manifesting out from that. And, and you can sort of look at the symptoms of their, the, the, ex, the outer expression of what they've manifested and push on it. You know, push it back, push it this way, squish it that way, move it that way. But they're going to just keep emanating from that origin point of their own reality. And yet, so many people in this world do not live with any awareness of that. But, but everything comes from there, no matter what we're trying to do. This is why even for making money or things like that. You have to stand deep in the center of your own magnetism. This is why we recommend practices like tithing and having a selfless attitude and a serviceful attitude toward what you do is the only possible way even to generate money because you have to be in harmony with that origin point of yourself. Everything emanates from the center. Now, going back to our images of Brahma with his four heads, after, after Swamiji spends most of the chapter arguing against the conventional explanation, he finally offers what he, he feels to be the self-evident, and it's so self-evident from one point of view, which is, he said, this isn't just a static form looking in four directions. He says, this is a, 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 an image of the fact that, that, that the creation, because Brahma represents the creator, it happens in all directions at once. It radiates out from the center. It's a, it's a flow of energy from one point going out, like, going out in this way. And so when we live in our, in our own um, consciousness in relation to this world, the more deeply we feel that wherever we are, we're just at the center of the universe because we're always standing within the center of our own reality. Or even if you're just going to um, uh, play with it in a sort of day-to-day -day basis, there's all this teaching now about being in the now and you know, just being in the present moment. But all of that is the more deeply you are at your own center, wherever you go, that's the complete, that's everything. Everything that could possibly happen is happening right there, right now. If you're at work, then work is your reality. If you're at home, then home is your reality. If you're taking care of your children, if you're sick in bed, whatever it might be, everything is just emanating from that center. And if you understand um, spirit at any point, you can understand all of it. And when we put circumferences on things, this is a bad experience, this is a good experience, you know, this is a past experience, this is a present experience, we put all these circumferences Swamiji says the way, we, the way the average person looks on at life is exactly the opposite. We see circumferences everywhere and centers nowhere. Isn't that so? We're anxious about money. We're anxious about health. We're anxious about relationships. We're anxious about whether we're respected or not. We're just anxious about so many things because all we see are these circumferences, not understanding the way it it really is. And this image of Brahma as the creative force just there. And then Swamiji talks about, and you know, I mentioned Brahma marrying his own daughter. And we might you know, do something to clean up his reputation there. You know, what we're dealing with is because Saraswati represents the, the Shashumna. And the Shashumna is that there's three subtle nerve, there's 
subtle nerve channels in the spine, and one is called the irda, and the other is the pingala, and then in the center is the shishumna. And the up and down movement of the breath, which is an expression of the up and down movement of the energy in the irda and the pingala, and that constant inhalation and exhalation, that constant rising and, and falling of the breath, the more it, it, it represents the fundamental duality that we live in. And we experience in our lives this constant you know, up and uh, reaction to the world around us. We see this world, it, the, the, the average person sees this world entirely in terms of the duality. There is what we like, and when we're, we feel positive about something, we tend to feel up, up, upward. I feel uplifted. You know, we inhale, we stand up straight. When we see something we don't like, we tend to be depressed about it. Our consciousness falls, our body falls, our breath becomes weaker. And there's this constant, the symbolism of the irda and the pingala, which is actually deeper than just the reactive process, but this constant up and down movement eventually comes together in, in uh, a unity and uh, the duality ceases. We recognize that the center point, which has created this moving vibration, we, we come back to center and then withdraw back into that deeper self, which is the shishumna. In, in deep meditation, those two currents unite and the kundalini rises right up the spine. And so what the image of Brahma is that the creative force doesn't... Um, the, the, the Saraswati representing the shishumnas, that everything comes into unity. Swami tries to explain it. I can't, I can't really say it better than this, but usually the daughter is given away. But in fact, the creative force withdraws and it all comes back to unity. And this is the, the symbolic meaning of his, of his reuniting with his own offspring, so to speak, which is the irda and the pingala unite together and, create, and come up the uh, deep spine in the shishumna. I can't explain it better than that. I don't feel that's very crystal clear, but if you're understanding what I'm trying to say, it's supposed to be a symbol of that. And then the goddess of wisdom awakens. The wisdom comes back to us and we know where we're standing. Um, it's a, I tend to think of it just more in terms of uh, I think well I, I, I think the way that Swami put it with the center everywhere is the best possible I know what I was starting to say I wanted to say earlier in regard to your question Sarah it's like I, I mentioned this to Swami at one point I mentioned to him you know as the years pass just every so often, I actually understand something really fundamental. And he was, you know, he was very sweet about it. He said, just sort of said in a very sweet way, but he said, yes, you know, yes, that's what happens. In other words, wisdom is an aspect of creation. Wisdom is an aspect of God. One of the eight manifestations of God is wisdom. And so we have this where we study these teachings and we practice these teachings and we meditate and we do all this work and we, we somehow think, ah, 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 you know, and then there's just going to be this sort of smashing through, like across the tape at the end. And my own actual experience after 40 years on this path is that every so often you go, huh. It's much more like that. It's just like, huh. And this is sort of, there's this like a tipping point. Just some little bit of understanding just slips through. And something that, that it, I think it must be like vrittis in your spine or just some little vritti just dissolves. The energy goes into um, the upward flowing energy and then all of a sudden just this little bit of enlightenment comes. And you think, huh, look at that. And it, it just, uh, I was saying during the break that When people are new on the spiritual path, and of course in my, in the position that I have in life, I'm often talking to people who are just starting, or I'm trying to encourage people who are slogging through and trying to get where they're trying to go. And on one hand, it's like, I think every step of the, jo of the journey is just joyous and fun. You know, whether you're having a horrible time or not, 
It's so grand just to have a clue what we're doing on this planet and where we're going. You know, just to, to have been, have the extraordinary good karma, to have the concept of self-realization somewhere active in your system. Again, when I was in my late teens and first was introduced to this, it, it, that's exactly how I felt. I felt prior to that that I was just doing all these things and all this stuff was happening because I was very energetic and very creative and all this, but I just didn't have any idea what the center point was. I knew the center point wasn't what anybody else was telling me it was, which was supposed to be academic excellence, worldly success, professional this. I mean, my parents were not ambitious in that sense, but it was just... It seemed self-evident that I was supposed to do something because I was talented and capable and and relatively speaking privileged. It was self-evident that I was supposed to do something. But whoa, nothing out there looked like it was worth doing to me. That's pretty much how I felt. And so there was just all this energy and no place to put it because what would I want to, to commit to? So when the spiritual path entered there, and the concept of changing your consciousness and self-realization came on. It was, it was really like having crawled across the desert and gotten to the oasis. And that's exactly how I felt inwardly, like one of those cartoons, you know, of the person just barely making it and then, you know, just drinking this water. So not, not one minute since that, whenever that awakening came have I been anything but blissfully happy. You know, even though one spends time weeping in one's life. But but underneath it, this blissful happiness that here we are and we know what we're doing. No matter how hard the journey, at least we're on the journey. But it's a slow process. Change is a very complicated thing. And it and and when and when you actually understand, as Swami writes in the in the last chapter here, that you have the key into the garden and the garden is the spine and the journey is up the spine and you're opening the gates each time of each of the chakras trying to raise your energy up and the way you open those gates is you overcome your likes and your dislikes and your attachments and all you're just doing is constantly you're working to overcome your likes and your dislikes and your attachments and I don't mean your attachments to like I love my child how could I give up my child I mean the the attachment of the ego to self-aggrandizement. You know, it's not like you have to become... People always think, oh, I don't want to follow a path like that because how could I ever give up my child? That's what people will very often say to me. I'm supposed to give up to my attachments? How could I ever give up my child? It's not what's being asked of you. The attachment we have to give up is the attachment to, to separate self-importance. If you have the responsibility for a child and you love your child with your whole heart, that is a God-given gift. You know, just do that. What you have to give up is the selfish aggrandizement that the ego is always seeking. It's always trying to be important. It's always trying to be recognized. You know, the selfless love that we have is really, that's the least of our problems. (laughs) For some reason, that's what people think they have to give up first. No, 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 no. That's the best part of us. What we really have to give up is all of this petty clinging. What about me? 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 I've been, uh, just personally, I've been struggling today because I, um, the, uh, I have a publicist who's trying to help, help um, sell the book that I've written about Swamiji, and they're trying to market me in various ways that will work, and they send me these little requests every so often to write something or another, five tips for this, you know, and... Uh, how to have a happy marriage, how to overcome stress, how to be a healthy person, how to make a New Year's resolution. You know, it's a, it's a game of trying to find a doorway in. And it's, I'm playing the game with them, and we're doing a good job. It's not a dishonest game. It's just trying to find something that they care about. So somebody had this idea that I'd written a little bit about marriage, and maybe I should write more about children. This was, that's what I brought up today. and I have to write to them and tell them, really, you can't sell me as an authority on parenting because I'm not. And then I stopped and thought, well, but I do know a lot about it. This is what I, why I was sharing all that I was sharing. But the other part of it is, and this is where I was really coming to, 
we live in a really selfish age. We are so confused. We are so confused as to where our happiness comes from. And it's a reaction. So we're in a reactive age right now. Because for coming out of Kali Yuga, form was everything. You utterly sacrificed everything of yourself. You sacrificed it for your family. You never got divorced. You sacrificed, woman sacrificed for husband. Husband sacrificed for the sake of the family. The parents sacrificed for the sake of the children. The children took care of the parents. You know, everybody was just doing their duty left, right, and center. And you really didn't stand around and ask yourself how you felt about it. It just wasn't a relevant question. And even if you had a feeling about it, what were you going to do about it? You know, and then we became increasingly wealthy, increasingly mobile, and increasingly concerned not about the form of things, but about the energy behind it. And we began to dismantle all these forms, which were, many of them were hypocritical, so it's not really such a bad thing in itself. But now we've pendulumed way over onto the other side, where the philosophy is, well, you've got to think about yourself. Don't worry about the kids, they'll be fine. It's their karma anyway. I mean, you know, things get really mixed up. And, and it's not necessarily wrong. Because it's, it's really not necessarily a victory just to hold an empty form and have everybody be miserable inside of it. You know, there's a, there, we, have to, we have to act from our own center. We have to act with integrity from the reality of who we are. But there's still this false idea that what will make me the happiest is to do what I want. And, and it's, it's, a, not a, it's not valid to just think about what you want or what you need. I have to think about me. Because if I'm not living authentically according to what I want, it's, it's very, very complicated. Because we have to also be very sincere. We can't... Um, suppression is not the same as transcendence. Swamiji writes in his book about marriage, he said it really, and in the Gita says the same, of what avail suppression is what the Gita says. And in Swami's writings he says, oh, if you just suppress your feelings, they'll just come out in some weird way later. <laughs> you know, you won't, really, you won't really escape them. They'll just get all twisted up and then force their way out from underground in some other place and make a big mess of things. But what we really have to get back to, and which we will, you know, I don't know how many generations it'll take, but we will, is to be able to act from our own point of origin with um, self-discipline that's born not of fear of other people's attitudes or of external consequences, but just out of the simple knowledge that where there is dharma, there is victory, and right action brings happiness. And that's simply the way it's going to be. But we're a ways away from that. You know, there's just sort of this, this free-for-all is what we're going to have to live through first until, because people are making experience the criteria for their behavior and we're just going to have to have a lot of experiences. Swami actually stated, he said, <laughs> he said this once very, very forcefully. He said, there will, there will not be social stability until we can raise up a whole generation of children with a completely different understanding of marriage and sexuality. And he said, and until we get, get focused enough as a society to raise a whole different generation, because, you know, sexuality drives these relationships so much, and our attitude towards sexuality as a culture now is just so um, lunatic, I think is the only word I can think of. And when you have that, that uh, sort of unbridled, um, uh, avaricious attitude towards sexuality as the, as the highest value or, or such a high value, then how can you have social stability among men and women? Because the teenagers and the adults, everybody's moving according to this energy without any understanding of where it comes from, how to control it, what it's really for. And Swami just said, until we work that out, until we can raise a whole generation of children with a whole different understanding, he said that we just won't have any social stability. So there's really not much point even in inspecting it. Expecting it will just go for the ride that we're going on now. And that is where we are, you know, where, where it's just um, creative forms of families and children growing up in all kinds of circumstances. And it's, it is their karma. It's everybody's karma. We're all in this together. 
But it's, it's, it's a very interesting time to be part of. And in here, which is where I was coming back to, inside that secret garden, it's all about overcoming those likes and dislikes, overcoming those attachments, overcoming that ego's thought that the more I can draw in for myself, the happier I'll be. It's, it's living more and more from the understanding that we live at the center of spirit and that everywhere we look, it's spirit. And then when, when you see that, this is what we were talking about. There are these little moments that I, I attribute partly to age, partly just to, I hope, to some level of spiritual understanding, where it just feels so different all of a sudden and you just see how the whole pattern comes together. And you realize that nothing less than all these years of spiritual effort, spiritual practice, every minute of it was required for just that little shift and moving into the next stage of um, living in that secret garden within ourselves. So, are there any other questions or thoughts for this evening before we end it? It seems that one of the driving forces of fundamentalist um, um, political and religious agendas both in our country and uh, in the Middle East and other countries is that uh, that fear of that of what you just said and Absolutely. wanting to bring to put the genie back into the bottle. Absolutely. It's I mean Kali Yuga and Dwapar Yuga are smashing up against each other. Yeah, definitely. They the experience as the criteria is not an attractive thought. People want orthodoxy, they want the rules to be it. It's very uh, it's a big change. And that's partly why we were was talking about loving the terrorists, so to speak, which was, you know, a big issue right after 9-11, you don't hear it that much now, but you have to stand inside that consciousness and you have to see it, 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 it's irreconcilable. You can't just say, oh, we can all live and let live. No, it can't because it, it needs that absolute certainty and that form to stay intact. And it, it, the genie's out of the bottle. It's, it's, uh, I think it will, it will smash together and Kali Yuga will be smashed, but it's going to be a difficult transition, I think, for sure. It already is. Think how frightening it is for such people, too. Everything they believe in is disintegrating in front of them. And, uh, you know, the moral standards of the world are not impressive. The freedom standards of the world are lovely. The individual self-determination is inspiring. But the actual result is kind of a mess. Again, speaking of my nephew, who's 20, I said to him, when he, he made some remark about something that had happened on campus where he was going to college. And he just made some casual remark about, I, it had something to do with the, what you know, some of the kids were doing in, in ways. I said, you really have no idea how morally reprehensible what you described is, do you? And he sort of looked at me like, essentially, no. And I said, and I was so... Um, not wanting to just be unable to relate, which is what happens, of course, as you reach my age, you just can't relate anymore to the young people. So I tried hard to think, see it from his point of view. And I said, you know, whatever values your generation ends up with will be very strong because they will be entirely self-created. Because you have grown up in a world in which Immorality is not even recognized as immorality anymore. You know, sensuality, self-indulgence, drugs, sex, self, um, is so powerful. They just don't even know that there's any other way to be. One of my friends, interesting, I'll just make this comment. She's an older woman working in a company, and, she, and the, her company got sold or something like that. She ends up with a boss who's half her age. And she realizes that he's raised in a culture of temporary alliances. That's how she described it. Where, you know, he's personal ambition and you make alliances, like a video game, you make alliances, and as long as you're serving each other, you're allied with each other, and as soon as it's not mutually serving, you just go off again. You know, she was raised in a world of loyalties, where you form your team and you stick with it and you stay together and everybody works and so just the whole again seeing it from the center you know it, families of lots of kids where the parents were divorced 
Maybe there was more than, you know, maybe the parents remarried more than once, there's stepchildren, just so many different things. And you sort of make these alliances for a while and then they fade away. And you see what a different orientation that is to this is my family, I was born into it, these are my parents, my grandparents, my uncles and my aunts and my home. And, you know, it's just, you have this, it's just everything is shifting. I live in this country for a while, I live in that country, I marry out of my culture, you know, we stay together for a while, we have a child here and I have a child there, you know, just... It's all just this kind of energy. It's making experience the criteria. It's just not a very deep level of experience. But the fact of the matter is, you see, truth exists. Truth is a reality. We are made a certain way, and our own experience will guide us back to that sooner or later. And in the meantime, kawamp between the two realities. So we might as well be cheerful about it because it's really out of our control. And we must have thought it was a good idea to be born now. (laughs) Maybe we think now that it was kind of stupid, but we must have thought it was a good idea at the time. It seemed like a good idea at the time, didn't it? You know? And it's not unpleasant yet. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. All right?